Hello and welcome to Lecture Series 10. In this series of mini lectures, we'll discuss working memory. Now, working memory is a sort of processing store that you need to do things like uh, take the orders of the customers at your restaurant and yet, you know, walk back with those orders and remember who gets what plate. Um, we've, we've spoken about short-term memory uh, we did that in lecture series nine, but short-term memory is really just a store for information. It doesn't enable you to work with that information at all. Working memory is all about the work. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, if I ask you to imagine um, walking to campus or walking to your favorite cafe, you can do that. Right? But to do that, you have to remember where you are and where you're going. You have to juggle a lot of information simultaneously. That's working memory. Another example is a quote that I love from an old comic named Groucho Marx. And the quote goes, One morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I'll never know. He always had a cigar, I'll never know. Uh, your ability to understand that sentence as it's going along and then to flip your understanding of the sentence, not that Groucho Marx was in the pajamas, but the elephant was somehow in his pajamas, that's working memory. Uh, if I tell you the statement, the complex houses married in single soldiers and their families. The complex houses? Oh, wait. Houses is a verb, not a noun, right? Reworking information. Um, all of that involves working memory. The researcher best known for foundational studies of our understanding of working memory is this fellow, Alan Badley from the University of York. Um, and he argued that working memory is needed to explain more complex cognition, more complex than simply hearing a list of words and repeating them at some time later. So he proposed this idea of a temporary system that can both store and manipulate information. Um, so short-term memory, you can think of that as just the storage of information. Working memory is storage plus working with it, manipulating the information. This uh, drawing here gives you a sense of how working memory fits into the three box model that we started out with. First, we talked about sensory memory. Then we talked about short-term memory. Working memory essentially comes next. In some models nowadays, short-term memory is gone and it's replaced completely by working memory, but I still find it interesting and useful to break uh, working memory into the storage part and the information manipulation part. So for working memory, you can see in this drawing that there are four boxes and we're going to talk about each of those boxes. The central executive, the phonological loop or sign loop, the episodic buffer, and the visual spatial sketch pad. We're gonna talk about each of those in turn. Let's jump in here to the central executive. And the central executive is basically the boss of working memory, right? It's a conductor. It decides what uh, information needs to be held now, what operations need to be carried out next, what's the next step, you know, what goes where, when, that's your boss, right? That's your central executive. So for example, if I told you to figure out this mathematical equation, two times four plus one, my working memory has to go, okay, four plus one, that's five. I need to hang on to that five and then come back and multiply by two. Now I get 10, classic example of working memory. And the directing of the whole thing, the choreography is the central executive. So for example, the central executive might need to actively inhibit or suppress certain kinds of information. If your central executive is sort of working in overdrive, um, then it's not gonna work very well for a while. It's sort of, it can get temporarily worn out. So I'm always curious about the um, news broadcasts these days that have, you know, the speaker is talking and then maybe there's a square up here where there's information and down along the bottom, there's like two or three streams of information. So you've got four things coming at you at once. 
your central executives got to figure which of those things do I need to pay attention to and everything else I need to suppress or actively ignore. Um, and if I do that for a long time, my ability eventually degrades. We know from neurophysiological research that the central executive is associated with the frontal lobes, specifically the prefrontal cortex or PFC. There's something called the dis-executive syndrome. And that's what happens when someone has damage to their frontal lobes. People with dis-executive syndrome don't have a very well-functioning central executive. So what does that mean? Well, it means that they have trouble with things like long-term planning. They're distracted very easily. It looks like um, ADHD, Attention Deficit and Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, they also have poor working memory. Um, in fact, there are some studies going on right now at the National Institutes of Health looking at whether people with ADHD may have some sort of uh, neurophysiological or processing abnormality in their frontal lobes. That's it for the central executive. Come back and we'll start talking about the phonological or sign loop.